How are we doing? Thumbs up. That's how we're doing. Anyone else doing? Someone doing here? Good. Oh, we got a lot of thumbs up over there. Thank you, my children, my people, my thumbs up people. If you could grab a Bible, uh, there's one like this in the seats in front of you. We're going to be in Amos 5 and 8. Um, we'll be quoting a famous verse in, verse in Micah 6, but most specifically, turn to Matthew 25. Uh, that's where we want to land and what we want to read uh, and focus on the most. Um, we're going to pray here in a minute, but first I wanted to kind of invite you into what we're talking about today. Uh, kind of a big thing, heavier topic, it's uh, consumed a lot of my mind, lost some sleep over it, because it's, it's just a lot, and it's annoying when someone says, here comes something heavy, but you know, whatever, it is what it is. So, you know, prepare yourself, buckle up, maybe we'll go over time, it'll be good though, to God be the glory. Uh, last week we started talking about prophets. If you don't know, we've been reading through the whole Bible together as a church, right? And if you've fallen off or lost track or something, that's fine, that happens, no big deal just pick it up. We read Amos and Micah this week. We'll be in uh, Isaiah, um, some Hosea, some other things this next week. Just pick it up and read one of them. That's fine. You know, for next week, just read Hosea, right? That's where we're at. Hosea next week. Yeah, just read Hosea for next week. Uh, for this week, we're going to be talking about the prophets. Do you remember the phrase that we gave prophets last week? Hey, my people, that's it. Oh, I'm so pumped. Carrie gets an A+. Plus. So, uh, covenant watchdogs. Say covenant watchdogs. So it's important when you read prophets because their whole goal, their big deal is that they remember the covenants. And we read them last week. We talked about the uh, um, a a Abraham covenant. But I was about to go all like Bible school and say, Abrahamic covenant, the Mosaic. But no, uh, we'll just, the Abraham covenant, the Moses covenant, the David covenant. Like they remember these covenants. And the prophets are like, hey, you said you would, God said, and you're not. That's their thing. They're watchdogs. They're watching out. And they're, ah, ah, they're, they're frustrated. They're fired up. They're ultimately calling people to what? We talked about this last week. To worship. They're calling people to worship. And we were unpacking what that looks like in Isaiah 6. Last week we talked about how worship looks like adoration, confession, forgiveness, and commissioning. This week we're going to specifically land on that commissioning because this other stuff is there and we talked about how important it is that our worship team, they're so crafty and they're, they're smart and God's given them a solid theology to pick songs that specifically do this. We don't just fill you full of songs that like happy clappy, we are for the Lord, it's about me. No, forget that. Like we're about singing scripture. We pray the word. We preach the word. We sing the word. We show the word. That's what we do when we gather. And so we talked about songs having adoration, confession, forgiveness, and commissioning. And we looked at Isaiah 6, and Isaiah wasn't just had a worship experience where it was done. He was commissioned to go do something else. And this week we're going to talk about what that commissioning looks like in the prophets. Uh, interesting, it'd be kind of like the go. In our church, we've got these four signs, if you didn't know. We worship God passionately. We connect with each other authentically. We grow to know God deeply, and we go declare the gospel boldly. And we mentioned, we specifically landed on this language of declare the gospel boldly instead of speak it or something, because declaring something is not just in what you say. It's in the entirety of your life. You declare something, uh, sometimes even without speaking it, you declare it with your life. Certainly it involves speaking it, right? Don't hear me ever say, just go and live your life, man. You need to boldly profess things with your mouth. But it's also in the entire aggregate of your life. So we're going to be looking at go today. What does it mean to go and worship? Why are we landing on this? It, I don't know if you've noticed, but the prophets can seem quite upset with worship. Have you noticed that? Has anyone been reading and you're just like, man, these prophets are... What are some ways that the Israelites have worshipped? If you've been reading the Bible, what are some ways they worship? Sacrifices, they do sacrifices. Uh, how did God want them to worship? When they gathered, they would do sacrifices, they would sing songs. I can give you a list, it's fine. They'd pray. A lot of things we do today, except we don't have animals up here that we're killing or anything, but there was things that they did that would be familiar to us. They had festivals, they'd gather and celebrate all to the Lord. That's what they were doing. I first came across this understanding in Amos 5 when I was in college. Um, when I say John Foreman, does that name mean anything to you guys? Raise your hand if you know John Foreman. Raise your hand if you know Switchfoot. Come on, y'all know Switchfoot. John Foreman's the lead singer, Switchfoot. When I was in college, he put out four solo albums, right? And his solo albums were trying to use exact biblical ideas in worship songs. And, and they were kind of, they weren't always meant to be sung in gatherings. They were meant to be contemplative, a lot of them. Uh, it's really interesting hearing him talk about it. If you remember, uh, Scott Loring used to lay, I've led a few times. Uh, maybe Nathan has, but we've sang the song, Your love is strong. You remember that song? That's a John Foreman song, right? Here's another one. He sings, 
I hate all your show and pretense. The hypocrisy of your praise, the hypocrisy of your festivals, I hate all your show. Away with your noisy worship, away with your noisy hymns. I stomp on my ears when you're singing them. I hate all your show. Who wants to sing that on Sunday morning? Come on, come on. Instead, let there be a flood of justice, an endless procession of righteous living. Living. Instead, let there be a flood of justice instead of a show. I hate all your show. This idea when I was in college blew my mind because I grew up in the 90s Christian boom. I grew up in, in youth camp and huge, I mean, like Hillsong was getting huge. Everyone was writing worship songs and we just gathered for passion conferences and we just sang our heads up and it was emotional and smoke machines and lasers and now they've got people that wave flags and it's like this is a big emotive experience and then it was like wait why is John saying God can hate this show ah Amos 5 here it comes directly pulled for Amos 5 Amos 5 21 this is God speaking I hate I despise your feasts. I take no delight in your solemn assemblies. Even though you offer me your burnt offerings, your grain offerings, I will not accept them. And the peace offerings of your fattened animals, I will not look upon them. Take away from me the noise of your songs to the melody of your harps. I will not listen. Church, hear this. Maybe you need to stop here and just contemplate this before we even go any further. God can hate what you do in here on Sunday mornings. He can hate it. And we don't like it. Oh, I can't feel that? You don't like that. That's not, I don't like it. It makes me severely uncomfortable. We assume that God's just hanging up everything we do on his proverbial refrigerator, say, look at my kids. That's not how it can function. God can hate what you do, and it should make you uncomfortable. God can look on this service and say, you know that church that gathered on Sunday morning that's at 1120 Madison? I hate that show. I despise it. This idea wrecked me. And if you're a youth kid here, you've heard me teach on this. Because I've started a lot of worship services in youth, in different uh, D-Now, in different youth camps with this concept. It matters what we do in here. It matters what we're about to do. Because we assume that we just passively do something and God's like, oh boy. But God can hate it. And we need to unpack that idea. God can hate our worship. It's uncomfortable. And and I know what you're thinking. Here's what you're going to say. You're going to say, I know, I know. God's after the heart. He wants a right relationship. It's a relationship, not religion, man. I know that's what you're thinking, right? Let's read the uh, solution. Amos 5 has a solution and Micah 6. Here's what, uh, after he says, take away from me your noise, Amos says, but let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. Micah 6, 8. He has told you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God? If you look here, I uh, put some little Hebrew ideas in here for you to help if you've been trekking how we've been kind of doing sermons. Uh, O man is the word Adam. Do you remember the first human created? It was called Adam. Adam and Eve in Hebrew literally mean human life, right? This is humanity. Adam and Eve. So when it says Adam, it's talking about all y'all. He has told you, O human, what is Tov. You hear it? What is good? What is good? God. He's the objective source of goodness. He created goodness. He created things. He spoke seven times. This is good. And what does the Lord require of you? What is good? But to do justice and love kindness. That word, love kindness, it's actually a Hebrew word called hesed. It's loving kindness. We taught on it last year, and we talked about how God defines himself in Exodus 34, and one of the phrases was loving kindness. And it's this idea that could also be translated mercy, because hesed is this idea of God being Love and kindness of mercy. He's merciful. He's love and kindness. It's all one concept. And to love kindness must mean to love the Lord because God is kindness. So what he's saying here is you need to do justice and love the Lord. You need to love his attributes, his kindness, his mercy, and to walk humbly with God. Now, that's not what I expect. I expect God to say something about relationship. I expect God to say something about my heart. Because that's what Isaiah and Ezekiel and Jeremiah and Jesus say. And that's true. They draw near to me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. And don't hear me miss that. That's important. Your heart posture is important. We're going to come back to that. But here, that is not where these prophets land. Isaiah, Micah, Amos, they all had this idea. We had so many verses we had to pull out for time's sake. They all hit this idea. Your worship stinks. I hate it. Your worship doesn't include justice and righteousness. God hates their worship because it's not tied to justice and righteousness. 
Worship equals righteousness equals justice. Sear this in your brain. Four words. Compassion, generosity, justice, righteousness. Righteousness meaning how I see you and how I treat you. It's a right relationship. We'll talk more about that word here in a minute, but I put a small definition there so you understood the biblical idea. It's a relationship word. Compassion, generosity, justice, righteousness. There was a town along a river, kind of by the bend of the river. There's several people in this town. It doesn't matter the amount. There's a lot of them. It's a community. They all got together one day to say, hey, we're going to we're gonna have a picnic. We're going to do the things we do at a picnic. Imagine your favorite festival. It was all happening. Grilling, chicken legs, tofu burgers, whatever your thing is. And they were grilling, and uh, the mamas were taking care of the kids and playing with them and, and doing the mom things, and the dads were doing the dad thing and, and grilling, or whatever it is. Just Im- import your understanding of this gathering. They're all hanging out by the river. Maybe some of them are jumping in, and they look out to the river, and they notice, oh, my goodness. There's three bodies floating in the river. Three bodies floating in this river. An old man, he said, guys, get in my, jump in my, my little boat here. I got a little fishing boat. And so I'll jump in his John boat. And they, and they go out there and they start pulling these people out of the river. They're unconscious. They pull them on the shore. They start, wake up, wake up. It's a little kid. Little kid, unconscious. His clothes are wet and tattered. He's clearly been abused in some way. There's an old man that's unconscious waking up, a woman. And as they wake up, they have no memory of anything. So the community, like, man, so there's a family that adopts the little kid. They take care of him. They, they give the old man clean clothes and, and a job, and then they start helping him out. Um, they, they help the woman get acclimated to society. And, and they realize the next day, holy cow, there's two people floating down the river. And the next day, another one. The next day, four people are floating down the river. These people are just unconscious. And so the community comes together and says, you know what? We need to put together, we've got just this whole boat retrieval, this boat survival, this boat rescue system. And they've got people that just work on the boats. And you have people who actually can run the boats. And you have people that are strong to pull people out the river. And they have these these centers where they can come and they can deal with people's emotional problems from like being unconscious. What? Who am I? I don't know anything. I'm here out of nowhere and wet. And I don't remember my former life. They have ways to get them jobs. They're showing them tons of generosity tons of compassion but then one day it's a small group of people that says enough why are these people floating why they can't get past why is this happening these people are unconscious in the river and, and we just we're doing everything we can but why is it happening? So they tighten their boots, and they strap on their back- backpacks, they say goodbye, they kiss their mamas goodbye, and they say, we're going to go upstream, and we're going to go and hike and camp, and we're going to go to the source, and we're going to find out what these people are, what's happening to them, and we're going to cut it off at the source. We're going to fix the problem. We're going to make these unconscious, broken people right. We're going to stop the problem. This is justice. Compassion, generosity, justice, Righteousness, a community living in right relationship together because of their generosity, compassion, and justice. Hold on to that thought. Hold on to the river people. What causes God to hate worship? What causes God to hate it? Let's run through it real quick. In Micah 3, hear these words. Its heads, referring to Israel leaders, give judgment for a bribe. Its priests teach for a price. Its prophets practice divination for money. These people are being paid off. These religious leaders, they respect. These prophets, these priests, they're corrupt. They're being paid off. God's fired up about it. Isaiah 1, 21 through 23. Everyone loves a bribe bribe and runs after gifts. Everyone loves a bribe and runs after gifts. They do not bring justice to the fatherless and to the widow. They do not come to them. Amos 8, we're going to camp out here. Starting in verse 4. Hear this, you who trample on the needy and bring the poor of the land to an end, saying, when will the new moon be over? When so we may sell grain? And the Sabbath, that we may offer wheat for sale, that we may make an epaph small and a shekel great and deal deceitfully with false balances, that we may buy the poor for silver and the needy for a pair of sandals and sell the chaff of the wheat. The Lord has sworn by the pride of Jacob, surely I will never forget any of your deeds. Just by reading these verses, 
What does injustice sound like? What are these things that are upsetting God? This is not justice, apparently, because they're supposed to be doing justice. So what, what does injustice sound like? Corruption. Okay. Talk to me. You guys, you guys, you guys just heard these verses. Selfishness, Selfishness right. Materialism. Materialism. Greed. And all these things are clearly trampling, is what it says. That's the language. These are things that are injustice. It mentions the needy, the poor, the fatherless, the widow. Religious leaders being bribed, using religion to oppress and deceive, doing nothing to help the orphans and widows, trampling the needy, and God hates their worship. This is Israel. They were called to do justice and righteousness. Go back and read. Uh, you can write it down. Genesis 18, 19. God says of Abraham, he will do justice and righteousness. And Abraham was supposed to be the one that brings everyone together. God's blessing his family. We're all coming together. It's all going to be right. That's not what Israel's doing. And look at verse 5, guys. They're worshiping. Do you know what the new moon and the Sabbath are? They're festivals. God called them to worship him. They're gathering and singing their song. He is, he is, trample the needy, he is. That's what they're doing. And you can laugh about it and you can just be like, oh, that's kind of a funny image. But I think we can relate. Because we know corrupt people. Have you ever known a corrupt pastor? You ever known someone to stuff their pocket? You ever known someone to lie, to build a religion for selfish gain? Come on. This is the West. This is our, this is, we know these stories. We can point to them right now. Pick your favorite heretic. You know this is happening. You're so concerned about their taxes. Why is this person not taxed? Why do they have a billion dollar home and they're a pastor? Come on. These things drive us nuts. But God hates worship over it. And these people are worshiping. But they're, divi they're divided. Hear this phrase. They're worshiping the new moon. But they're waiting for it to be over. They're checking their little sundials on their wrist and saying, Man, how can we go sell grain? Let's get this worship stuff over so we can go, we can go sell our grain so that we can, we can go offer wheat for sale that we may make an epaph small and a shekel great, that we can use deceitful scales to make money, that we may buy the poor for silver. Silver is often an analogy for debt, getting someone an extreme debt in Scripture, that we may buy the poor to give them debt. We own them, they're indebted to us. And the needy, We'll buy them for a pair of sandals. Can you imagine the oppression of someone so poor saying, I need to work, but I can't work because I don't have sandals. Oh, you'll give me severe debt so that I can have sandals, so that I can get out of debt? This is the situation. This is corruption. People being stepped on. Sell chaff of the wheat. We've talked about this before. What is chaff? Is chaff valuable? No. But they're going to sell it. Why? Money. Listen, church. How we spend our time, our money, our energy, our resources, our brain power, it reveals what we truly worship. What consumes your mind when you're not here, when you're not busy doing something else? Is it that weight that you're going to lose and how awesome you'll be? Is it that promotion you're going to get? Is it that time when your family's finally perfect? Is it that marriage that you're going to obtain? Is it the health that you're going to get back to? Is it the 401k you're going to receive? Is it the retirement? Is it the leisure activity? Maybe those things that are consuming your heart, your mind, your time, your resources, your brain power. Maybe those things are your idol. That's surely what they're worshiping. They're sitting in church just like you, doing exactly what God told them to do, but they're not because they're not doing justice and righteousness. What's the solution for all this oppression, for all this exploitation? Amos says, Micah says, it's justice. It's righteousness. Because worship equals righteousness equals justice. That's what happens here. Worship equals righteousness equals... They're all connected in some way. They're all inextricable from each other. You can't have one without the other. That's what the prophets are trying to tell us. You know, in the Bible, justice and righteousness, they're like synonyms. I'm not going to take you through your Hebrew moments here and tell you what the Hebrew word is for this and that, because who, who cares? Like, we can move past that. You can just know. You can trust me from all the study. These words are tied together in Scripture. They're synonyms. That's why God originally told Abraham, one of the first times these words are used in Genesis 18, these people will do justice and righteousness. Why? Because they're synonyms. They go together. You can't do one or the other. 
They're relational words. Righteousness is not just that thing about God that's so perfect that gets just turkey basted into us when we receive Christ. That's holiness. Righteousness is a right relationship. It's how I see you and how I think about you. If I see Jimmy and I'm kind to him, but I think he's a schmuck who needs to lose weight, then I'm not right with him. I don't have a righteous relationship with him. I'm trampling him. Righteousness is to have a right relationship things to be right. And so that's why it's so valuable that when Jesus dies, he's given us righteousness. That's why Abraham's faith is credited to him as righteousness. It's a right relationship with God. Think about that. If it's how I see Brian and how I treat Brian, it's also how God sees us and treats us. We deserve death and punishment and separation. But through Jesus, we're seen in a right relationship with God. That's what it means to have righteousness. These words are synonyms together in Scripture. They go together. Why? Why do they go together? Psalms 89, 14. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Mercy and truth go before you. God is righteousness. God is justice. It's who he is. Inseparable from his character. You want to understand what those things are? Look to God. Make sense of them. If you really want to make sense of them, look to Jesus on the cross. More on that later. God is righteous and just. He's the floor. He's the objective standard, if you will. So if you want to know what these things, and then he created us in his image. God identifies with the people who are at the bottom of the ladder, as he always did. So what does justice mean? We've talked about what it isn't, and the river analogy kind of helps us, right? Thanks for the parable. But, like, what is justice? There's a video that I think is really great, and it talks about how Israel got into justice, how they got away from it and became more like Egypt when they were supposed to be something different. Um, the images in this video, the uh, analogies, the illusions, I think are really powerful and will really help us. And again, I wish we had three or four Sundays to talk about this. We don't. And so there might be gaps, and you might be the justice expert in the room, and we can talk about it. But I think for some time purposes, so we can keep moving along here, we're going to watch this video on justice. It's going to help clear some things up for us. If you were a praying mantis, it would be socially acceptable to devour your mate. And if you're a honey badger, you have no regard for other animals. You don't care. If you're a panda with twins, it's normal to abandon one to take care of the other. But if humans do any of these things, we would call it wrong, unfair, or unjust. Yeah, why is that? Why do humans care so much about justice? Well, the Bible has a fascinating response to that question. On page one, humans are set apart from all other creatures as the image of God. Yeah, God's representatives who rule the world by his definition of good and evil. And this identity, it's the bedrock of the Bible's view of justice. All humans are equal before God and have the right to be treated with dignity and fairness no matter who you are. And that would be nice if we all did that. But we know how the world really works. And the Bible addresses that too. It shows how we are constantly redefining good and evil to our own advantage at the expense of others. Yeah, self-preservation. And the weaker someone is, the easier it is to take advantage of them. And so in the biblical story, we see this happening on a personal level, but also in families and then in communities and in whole civilizations that create injustice, especially towards the vulnerable. But the story doesn't end there. Out of this whole mess, God chose a man named Abraham to start a new kind of family. Specifically, Abraham was to teach his family to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice. Yeah, doing righteousness, that's a Bible word I don't really use, but what comes to mind is being a good person. But what does that even mean, being good? The biblical Hebrew word for righteousness is tzedakah, and it's more specific. It's an ethical standard that refers to right relationships between people. It's about treating others as the image of God. With the God-given dignity they deserve. And this word justice, it's the Hebrew word mishpat. It can refer to retributive justice. Like if I steal something, I pay the consequences. Exactly. Yet most often in the Bible, mishpat refers to restorative justice. It means going a step further, actually seeking out vulnerable people who are being taken advantage of and helping them. Yeah, some people call this charity. But mishpat involves way more. It means taking steps to advocate for the vulnerable and changing social structures to prevent injustice. So justice and righteousness are about a radical, selfless way of life. Yeah, and you find this idea all over the Bible. Like... Here, in the book of Proverbs, what does it mean to bring about just righteousness? Open your mouth for those who can't speak for themselves. 
And what do these words mean for the prophets, like Jeremiah? Rescue the disadvantaged and don't tolerate oppression or violence against the immigrant, the orphan, and the widow. And like here, look in the book of Psalms. The Lord God upholds justice for the oppressed, gives food to the hungry, and sets the prisoner free. But he thwarts the way of the wicked. Whoa, he thwarts the wicked? Yeah, in Hebrew, the word wicked is rasha. It means guilty or in the wrong. It refers to someone who mistreats another human, ignoring their dignity as an image of God. So justice and righteousness is a big deal to God. Yes, it's what Abraham's family, the Israelites, were to be all about. They ended up as immigrant slaves, being oppressed unjustly in Egypt. And so God confronted Egypt's evil, declaring them to be rasha, guilty of injustice. And so he rescued Israel. But the tragic irony of the Old Testament story is that these redeemed people went on to commit the same acts of injustice against the vulnerable. And so God sent prophets who declared Israel guilty. But they weren't the only ones. There's injustice everywhere. Yeah, some people actively perpetrate injustice. Others receive benefits or privileges from unjust social structures they take for granted. And sadly, history has shown that when the oppressed gain power, they often become oppressors themselves. So we all participate in injustice, actively or passively, even unintentionally. We're all the guilty ones. And so this is the surprising message of the biblical story. God's response to humanity's legacy of injustice is to give us a gift, the life of Jesus. He did righteousness and justice, and yet he died on behalf of the guilty. But then God declared Jesus to be the righteous one when he rose from the dead. And so now Jesus offers his life to the guilty so that they too can be declared righteous before God, not because of anything they've done, but because of what Jesus did for them. The earliest followers of Jesus experienced this righteousness from God, not just as a new status, but as a power that changed their lives and compelled them to act in surprising new ways. Yeah, if God declared someone righteous when they didn't deserve it, the only reasonable response is to go and seek righteousness and justice for others. This is a radical way of life, and it's not always convenient or easy. It's courageously making other people's problems my problems. This is what Jesus meant by loving your neighbor as yourself. It's about a lifetime commitment fueled by the words of the ancient prophet Micah. God has told you, humans, what is good and what the Lord requires of you is to do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. The image of Jesus removing the red sash and putting on the white sash is worth thinking about and several cups of coffee or tea in contemplation. It's a powerful thought. The video talks about uh, retributive justice and restorative justice, and we don't have time to unpack all of that, but the understanding in Scripture is that restorative justice is what we are called to, and it is complete. It is more full. It is the standard that Christ has called us to. He has told you, O oh human, what is good? What is tov? And what does the Lord require of you? To do justice, to love kindness, to walk humbly with your God. Let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. See, there's a clear connection here between how they worship and how they approach justice and righteousness. They're interlinked. But how do we do this? Things are clearly broken. Amos 9 tells us, like the video uh, kind of explains, Amos 9 tells us that there will be a, uh, that there's going to be the Lord. He's going to raise up the booth, the tent the, uh, of King David, that he's going to bring back. Like I said, the stump is the seed, right? We talked about that last week, that there's a prophecy that, that someone from King David's going to come. And it's funny, when you get to Acts 15, uh, when they're in the Jerusalem council and the apostles are talking about this and arguing about Gentiles and circumcision like they do, they quote Amos 9 and they say, this is Jesus. Jesus is the one who's going to bring in the Edomites, who's going to bring in the Gentiles, who's going to be the one from King David. Jesus is everything. And Jesus identifies with the poor and broken. Interesting list about Jesus, just in case you are unfamiliar with these things. Jesus was poor. 
Jesus was poor. Jesus, uh, he was born in a manger, which if you don't know what that is, it's, it's like where cows and horses eat. It's a trough. Any farmers here? You seen those things? Did you, would you have your baby born there? Come on. He was poor. His parents gave doves for sacrifices. That's where poor people would use those for sacrifices because they ain't got no money. Jesus was born into poverty. Not like the Messiah King David. That was not the understanding. See, Jesus was born immediately, humbled himself to identify with the poor. He had no home. Jesus has verses where he talks about that. Foxes, they've got dents. I got no home, no place to rest my head. He had a borrowed donkey, a borrowed tomb. Jesus was sold for silver. <laughs> Interesting what Micah was saying about how you, you get them in debt. Jesus was sold for silver. Jesus was a victim of great miscarriage of justice at his trial where the religious leaders trampled him, paid off, twisted. By all social standards, Jesus had nothing on this earth, and yet he is king. Jesus is everything. Say Jesus is everything. If you're not a Christian, if you're skeptical, if you're watching from home, you're like, yeah, I heard it all before. Search other religions and other historical leaders. There is none out there that has a God, a king like this. There is none that essentially identify with the poor, the broken, the messed up. In all other religions, the great people are the ones blessed by the Lord. They must have had the gifts from the gods to be able to be Hercules. There is no religion that says this. It was so controversial. It doesn't make any sense because God is just. God is right. Jesus has a parable that I want us to slowly read, and we're going to camp there for the rest of the sermon. We're going to slowly read it, and then I'll paraphrase the second part of it. If you could turn to Matthew 25... And slow your minds down to hear these words. I think it's one of the hardest things Jesus ever said. Because it breaks apart a lot of paradigms that I want to hold true. It's a hard thing to fit into every doctrine cleanly because it's, it's just hard. And I want to wrestle with it together because Jesus clearly is picking up on what Amos and Micah and Isaiah and the prophets are saying. There's something about how we treat others, how justice and righteousness are married together in worship that's essential. Starting in verse 31, Jesus says, When the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the angels with Him, then He will sit on His glorious throne. Before Him, He will be, ga uh, he will be gathered all the nations, and He will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And He will place the sheep on His right, but the goats will be on His left. Then the king on the throne, he'll say to those who's right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you doing these things? You're the king. What a silly thought. You weren't naked, king. You weren't in prison. You weren't hungry or thirsty. You're the king. When did we see you? Verse 40. And the king will answer them. Truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. Then he will say to those on the left, Depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For you did not feed me when I was hungry. You did not give me a drink when I was thirsty. You did not welcome me when I was a stranger. You did not clothe me when I was naked. You did not visit me when I was sick. You did not come to me when I was in prison. And they'll say, But Lord, they got the same excuse. We, how silly. You weren't in prison. Come on. You're the king. You weren't thirsty. We did our songs. We did the religious stuffs. You weren't, come on. Truly I say to you, as you did not do to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. This is not specifically about your salvation. So before you freak out and start having a list of what it means to be saved. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And only through him are you saved, through believing in him, your faith in him, him giving you his Holy Spirit as your eternal mark, right? Ephesians 2, Ephesians 4. These are all things. Romans 5. This is your faith in Jesus is what saves you. Jesus is speaking to a posture of your life that has to be an outcome of that salvation. 
And so maybe if these things are foreign to you, maybe it is worth questioning a little bit. I mean, the list here, he talks about the hungry, the thirsty. Talks about the stranger, which is interesting phrase, both in Greek and Hebrew. Uh, we don't have time to unpack that. The stranger, those who are aliens, the outcast, the naked, the sick, the prisoners. Truly I say to you, when you did to the least of these, you did to me. Is this not love? Can you hear when Jesus says, this is the greatest commandment. Love the Lord with everything you have. And the second is like it, meaning it's the exact same. They go together. They're essential. You cannot be loving the Lord if you don't love your neighbor. You cannot love your neighbor if you're not loving the Lord. Righteousness is a relational word. Justice is a relational world. How can we make these things right? How do we go to the source? Inconvenience, disadvantaging ourselves for the convenience and the advantage of our community, the poor and the needy. Jesus takes this very seriously, church. He uses eternal language here. It's hard. I encourage you to read this five times this week. Please, read it before the Lord and ask Him, what are you saying to me? By the way, do you know what upsets Jesus the most? What gets Jesus real mad? Fake religion. What did Jesus do with people who were twisting religion and desecrating his father's house? Do you remember? I wish I had a table here to flip. Wouldn't that be a cool moment? Just... Jesus was fired up. And did you know that his apostles did the same? Did you know that all through scripture, what, what upsets Paul the most... When Peter's separating these things out, when people are pushing down the Gentiles because of circumcision, you're not good enough, you're not as religious as me. When he says, says the reality is in Christ, don't let anyone judge you because of any new moon harvest, any festival, any Sabbath. The reality is in Christ. This upset Paul. It's a huge tension with the early uh, believers. James, he writes about struggling about how they were pushing down the poor and they were celebrating. The verses we read every time we do Lord's Supper, read the context in 1 Corinthians 11. The whole issue is that they were pressing down the poor. You don't get to do communion like us because you have to work too long. You're poor. You get here late. You don't get to celebrate like we do. Everyone cares about how the stranger, the thirsty, the hungry, the destitute, the naked, the imprisoned, everyone cares about how they're treated. So much so that the early church was known for this. They were those of the way. What brought in people to the early church? The way they treated other people. What brought in the religious leaders who hated them? Who said, this is not religion. You guys are faking it. This is all bad. Don't you know the Hebrew scriptures? You Christians are stupid. What brought those religious leaders into the church? The way they treated other people. They were fascinated by the way they treated widows and orphans in particular. They were fascinated by the way they were taking care of each other. Selling their possessions. Living with radical generosity. There's some clear connection between the worship of the Lord and justice and righteousness. Church, we can't just sit here in our own bubble and worship. Worship is not the songs you sing. It's not your job. It's not the Bible scriptures you read. Those things are included and they're important. Worship is how you treat other people with justice and righteousness. And if it is not coming out of you, if those things are foreign to you, then it's worth taking pause and saying, is my religion myself? Am I creating a God in my own image? Am I actually worshiping my own personal understanding of these things? Or am I worshiping the God who made himself poor so that he could relate to the broken, so that he could sacrifice for them? So what do we do? This is, I mean, begs the question, you all know injustice. We're going to list some right here. What do we do with the injustice we see? What about the poor people holding signs in Jeff City? The unsheltered, those who don't have homes. What about the water problem? You've heard me say up here a lot. Every six seconds, a child dies somewhere in the world because of malnutrition directly related to water. Every six seconds. Do the math. I've been preaching for a little over 35 minutes. How many kids are dead around the world? No water. How much water did you drink today? Come on. I drink a gallon of water a day. You know how many kids that could save? Sheesh. Orphans. Foster care. What do we do about that? Right? There are so many orphans. Do you know if one Christian family of every Christian church adopts one kid in America, we have no orphans in America? What are we doing, church? What do we do with this problem? Human and sex trafficking. You saw some gals come and talk about it a few weeks ago. Right? Our mission team's trying to connect with them. What do we do about this issue that's happening in our city? 
Make no mistake, there are young girls that are trafficked this week, directly connected to St. Louis, Kansas City, and Springfield, here, through Jeff City. What do we do about slave labor? Shrimp? Gosh, we talked about this one Sunday. Do the research. Shrimp is full of slave labor all over the world. Have you eaten shrimp this week? Come on. Unjust wages for our convenience? Look at how people are paid to create the cell phone that you carry in your pocket. How they're paid versus how you're paid. Come on. If you're like me, you expect systems and laws and policies and grants and the social machine to fix all this. That's what I expect. Jesus puts it on the disciples, on the church. Jesus doesn't point to Rome. Jesus doesn't point to systems, politics, and policies. He says it's a church problem. Injustice and unrighteousness is a church problem solved only through King Jesus. Before you get all upset and hear just the woke socialist pastor talking or whatever you import in your mind. Because this is a hairy issue. This is a landmine to talk about, church. As soon as I start talking about justice, I mentioned a second ago uh, some, some social issues, some things up there, and it's a landmine because now you paint me to be this sort of person. He probably votes for this person. He probably thinks that. Forget about it. You know what predates socialism and capitalism in America and Rome and Babylon? The Lord and His law. This isn't socialism. This isn't some ism that I'm throwing out there, that I'm promoting. This is the church, King Jesus' bride, the Lord's people coming together to live what the Lord called us to, doing unto the least of these. Don't let your politics distract you. Those things are important. Thank God that we have people doing things with that. Thank God that we have mechanisms in our country moving towards it. But Jesus doesn't put it on the mechanism. He puts it on the church. How we spend our time, our money, our energy, our resources, our brain power reveals what we truly worship. Maybe you truly do worship this country and you really believe that's the solution for all this. You don't have to go help the poor, the needy, the naked because you pay your taxes. Maybe that reveals what you truly worship. <sighs> Slow down. How are you doing? Are you, are you feeling guilty? Are you feeling bummed? This is the hardest thing about talking about this stuff, guys, because uh, studying it myself, talking about now, I feel it. I see the look on your face, and it just feels like the, the marketing tactic. My generation's so good at this with Tom's shoes and uh, coffee that you can pay a lot of money for, and then therefore, you know, you're doing something around the world. You vicariously live through some other justice that you don't ever have to touch. Like, my generation marketed that. It's so great. And you can just come and guilt, 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 and shoot your guilt gun and make people feel bad, and then they'll buy special shoes that make them look really cool, and then also they're helping people in other countries. And we just completely vicariously don't have to touch the issue at all ourselves, right? And so when you put this on, the marketing here, what it sounds like is, oh, David's going to give us a mission sermon that guilts us into giving some money, into doing something. Hear me, church. Guilt and shame and duty are of no help to you. That's not the gospel. If you're doing this because of guilt and shame and duty, it will never be beautiful to you. Beauty, not duty. Jesus is beautiful. Guilt, shame, and duty can't change your heart. Only Jesus can change your heart. I have trouble doing justice when I think that I'm better or superior than other people. Because I do. There are people I definitely look down on. Because that's who I am. That's who I was raised to be. That's what our country, our culture, there are people we naturally look down on because they've done something against us or because we're naturally better, whatever it is in your mind. And maybe you're above that and you don't want to admit that about yourself. But I, I'm not. And I'll admit, when I think I'm superior to people, I do justice very badly. But the gospel puts me to the ground in worship. The gospel unifies and says, we are all broken, destitute, unholy, unrighteous, separated from the Lord. We are all on the same playing field as equally deserving of separation from God. So when I look to the gospel, justice helps me because I don't have to think I'm, I'm better than everyone else. I have trouble doing justice when I feel empty and shallow. I got to climb the ladder. I got to work really hard. I got to impress you guys. I got to impress these people. I got to make more money. I got to settle my life. 
But the gospel, see, it fills me up. It says the verdict is already in. I don't have to. You don't have to. None of us has to go to court. Take ourselves to court. Everyone will say, am I good enough at my job? Am I good enough at this worship service? Was my sermon good enough? Am I a good enough daughter? Am I a good enough husband? Am I a good enough father? Am I a good enough mom? Am I a good, good looking? Can I deadlift enough? Did I sell enough cars? The gospel says that isn't what takes you to court. Jesus went to court for you. The verdict's already in. Jesus lived, died, and resurrected. Therefore, we can do justice and righteousness through his spirit entering us, through his transformed vision of the world. The prophets, Jesus, and apostles, they all saw justice and righteousness as a worship problem. It's primarily a worship problem. Awareness is helpful. Listing out these things, those things are helpful, but they might ultimately just bring guilt and shame, which is an inward posture, thinking about me. But the gospel makes us think about other people. He has told you, O oh human, what is good. What does the Lord require of you? To do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with your God. In the river parable that we talked about earlier, I think it's a beautiful story. And every analogy can break down somewhere, sure. But when you hear that story, you think, man, it, it took that community to respond to this issue. It took people working on the boats, driving the boats, pulling people out of the river, rehabilitating these people, counseling these people. It also took people going to the source to fix the problem. Thank God that we have people in our church that just so passionately are full of compassion and full of justice that they will stand before the orphans and the oppressors of the orphans and the foster system and say, we are for these kids. I know them. They sit over here a lot of times and they'll tell you all about it because they're so full of justice and compassion. Thank God for those of us who are gifted with generosity. God has given us much and he expects that we give much. And so we live like this. We don't hoard for ourselves and think that it's all mine and my time, my money, my resources, but we live like this because in a community that does justice, in the kingdom of Jesus Christ, we need everyone. The foster situation, the shrimping situation, the sex trafficking situation, the water problem, it is not solved by you or or you, or you. It is solved by the church. One body coming together, each of us using our gifts. We are all called to generosity, to compassion, to justice, to righteousness. But thank God that some of us, we live and breathe it. There are some of you in here who are, oh, can't help but be generous. You're ready right now. You Turn me loose. I'll write a hundred dollar check for shrimp. Fix it right now. Let's go. You're ready. You're pumped. There are people in here that are so compassionate. You're like, oh, I forgot about sex trafficking. This week, I got to pray about it. This is so on my heart. There are some of you who are in justice, and you're like, man, I didn't even think about how the crystals in my cell phone could be connected to slave labor. Hold on. Thank God. Not guilt and shame. Not duty, but the beauty of Jesus. Jesus has put that in you. Speak up. Live generously. Live compassionately. Live justly. This is what God has required of you. We do these things because Jesus is alive and in us. We know this, church. Worship and righteousness and justice all, are all interlinked. They're all one. They're all connected. Just like this. If your worship doesn't lead to a flood of justice, an endless pouring out of righteousness, right relationship with others, sacrificing yourself for the betterment of others like Jesus, doing unto the least of these... If it doesn't look like that, then it's not worship. It's a terrible hobby. It's a silly thing that we're doing in here. This is what the prophets are telling us. This is what Israel was struggling with. This is what we struggle with in our culture and in, in America, in the West. This is what I struggle with personally in my family. So what do we do? Let me give you a real basic thing as we come to close. Open your hands. This week, open your hands. And ask the Lord, Lord, who are the least of these? And how do I connect with them like Jesus? Open your hands. Open them to the Lord. Humbly walk before the Lord. Lord, who are the least of these? And how do I connect with them like Jesus? Think about the list Jesus gives. The naked, the poor, the thirsty, the hungry, the imprisoned, the stranger. Lord, who are the least of these and how do I love them like Jesus? Then open your hands towards those people. Open your hands to the Lord. Open your hands towards others. That's your response this week. This is a worship problem. 
You don't solve it by getting really passionate and guilty and shameful and dutiful and just going out and doing it. You solve it by worship. You walk humbly with God because they're all connected. So church, I would encourage you to join us as we worship, as we wrestle with with our missions team, with the money that we receive, with the time, with the energy. How are we as one body connecting with the naked, the strangers, the poor, the thirsty, the hungry? Lord, who are the least of these? How do I connect with them? For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me a drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these, you did it to me. I don't know what your response needs to be right now to this. I hope and I pray that it's not guilt and shame. Because evil will use that to make it all about you. I hope that it's to look around and realize we are one body. We are river people. We go out to the river as one body and we pull out the unconscious and we help them. And then we go to the head of the river and we figure out what is breaking this issue and how do we solve it as a church. We can't solve all the issues. We're one church. Look around. There's not a ton of us in here. Even if there's 100,000 of us in here, we can't solve all the issues. But if we start with worship, we say, God, you are directly calling us this. Lord, as an individual, as a church body, who are the least of these? How do we love them like Jesus? How do we do unto them like Christ? When you've done unto the least of these, you've done unto me. Let's pray. Father, is this, this, these words of Jesus, the words of the prophet, they lay heavy on us as you intended them to. That's how you spoke them, and, and I believe that's how you meant them. I pray that your spirit would give us ears to hear and eyes to see. May your spirit guide our response to this. As individuals, as family, as church, all intricately connected as your body, may we reach out to the poor and powerless. May we be your church, your people, who are disadvantaging and inconveniencing ourselves for the advantage and convenience of others. To love our neighbor as ourselves, and thereby to love you, God. Amongst all the words, all the heaviness, I ask your spirit would guide our response. Teach us to open our hands to you and open our hands to others in justice, in righteousness, in generosity, and in compassion, just as you are, Lord. We trust you. Guide our response in this time. Amen. If you need someone to talk or pray with, I'll be down here.